guys. Just finished up watching Bad Batch Season 3, the three-episode premiere that dropped today. Um, I was pretty excited for this season, and I'm still pretty excited because these first three episodes did a great job of basically just laying the groundwork for the season, I feel like. Um, I'll go over just short summary real quick, no spoilers of each episode, just kind of a synopsis so you have an idea of what to expect, and then I'll go into spoilers on each episode and uh, predictions with some images so you guys can see as well what I'm talking about if you've already seen the show or if you just don't mind getting those spoilers. Um, the first episode's called Confined. <coughs> If you remember, in the season three, Omega was recaptured by the Empire. So at this point, she's imprisoned on Tantus, and she's adjusting to her new life as a prisoner. Um, it's kind of just one of those episodes where you get a check back in with Omega, Crosshair, and what's going on at Tantus. Um, I'm just going to leave it there so that we don't go into any spoilers on that episode. Episode 2 is called Paths Unknown. This one is shifting focus back over to the other members of the Bad Batch, Hunter and Wrecker. They are following a lead and make a discovery while trying to find Omega and rescue her. Um, leave that one there as well. Going to go into some cool little details from that episode here in a minute. Third episode is called Shadows of Tantus. Uh, synopsis is Omega and Crosshair hatch a daring plan. So obviously they're both prisoners at Mount Tantus. And after our check-in episode with them, episode one, this is, you know, us getting back with them, seeing what their plan is going forward and kind of laying the groundwork for a lot of the rest of the season. But if you don't want any spoilers, if you don't want anything detail-wise from the episodes other than what I've told you so far, this is the time to leave. Um, at this point, I'm going to pull up each episode and kind of go through each one, talk about things I thought were relevant. So thank you for checking this out. If you're spoiler-free, see you later. Okay, so... Here we are over on Disney Plus now. Let's see my Mall Walker account. But first episode, Confined. We're not going to actually play it, just so you know. Starts out with a little summary, giving us um giving us essentially what happened at the end of last season and the basic setup of where Crosshair is mentally how he's kind of rejected the Empire now at this point and where a lot of the other members of the Bad Batch are at this point and kind of showing us again Tech's death here at the end showing us Omega being recaptured and Hunter and Wrecker you know deciding they need to go rescue her the episode opens with some TK troopers arriving at Mount Tantus and actually going down in inclement weather. Um, that's kind of just a setup to tell us that around Mount Tantus is not safe at all. Wildlife is hostile. So those troopers do not have a happy ending. <laughs> um, then it cuts to Omega here with Dr. Emery Carr another clone who we still haven't learned very much about yet other than the fact that these female clones were not on Kamino. Apparently um, they were somewhere else during the Clone Wars, wherever they were first cloned, maybe here at Mount Tantus. And uh, Omega actually mentions that and it's actually stated, so it's kind of cool. Explains their absence. Here you see more of the clone doctors working on our clone troopers, doing experiments on them. And for a while we've, well really since season one, a lot of people have speculated that Omega might be 
force sensitive that that might be her special augmentation that makes her part of clone force 99 or something along those lines and th that's why she has such high intuition and um then takes initiative and you know does things that some people might be like why are you doing that but it usually works out okay for her um but we also find out in this episode that Nala Se has been prolonging the discovery that Omega can support the Force, that she can support midichlorians, because what they're trying to do is create a clone specimen that can support what they're calling an M count, for short for midichlorian, um, that is equal to or higher than the Emperor, because long term this is um, the Emperor's plan to be immortal. This is what you eventually see transform into his work on Exegol in the sequel trilogy, and I think that hopefully Omega is going to escape the fate of being a test subject, and that that's why it takes them so long, and why they don't have a perfect specimen with Snoke, and why he's kind of deformed but we'll have to see how that goes and if the bad batch can rescue her and get away with her and the empire not win in the end you know omega's kind of learning a lot more about how the empire is not doing normal experiments anymore about how it's a little more sinister and here this is actually pretty cool nala say gets a sample of omega's blood and we see her throw it in this slot here and destroy it so that the Empire does not get the results on it showing that her blood can support midichlorians that her genetic template is good for it here she is deleting uh, Omega's data from the computer also after it got scanned but before it gets the tests administered uh, Dr. Hemlock get Scorch here I know that a lot of people are hoping to see more of the Clone Commandos this season, more of Delta Squad. We do get a decent amount of Clone Commandos this episode. Get more of these security marked Clone Camino, almost like the Camino guards with the gray markings. This is Omega feeding the Lucra Hounds. These are hounds that the base employs to basically keep the wildlife at bay and outside of the base. Um, kind of referring back to those hostile creatures that surround the base that were shown to us at the beginning of the episode. Here we see Omega kind of sneaking around, talking to Crosshair, checking back in with him, showing us that she still wants to rescue him, get him to go with her, we also see that she's been tracking her time here, and by my count, it looks like 21 days since the end of season three and when she was captured. So maybe 21 days, if this, if these markings are days and not something else. Um, I'm assuming they're days because it seems like weeks would be definitely too long, too big of a jump. But 21 days since she's been brought to Mount Tantus. This was pretty neat. You see here she recreates her stuffed animal that she had on the, the Marauder using straw and just supplies that she gets from the um, from the base when she's feeding the Lucra Hounds. Then we get another time jump forward here where you see she's now been here many days. I mean, I don't know if we're even seeing the farthest left edge here, but 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. I mean, that's, we're looking at almost five months. So she's been here a while now. Her hair's longer. See, she has it back in a ponytail. Um, she's still working for the doctor and I'll say, 
I will say is still kind of prolonging the progress on this research by just destroying Omega's blood samples, which is I mean, brave of her given how she's seen the rest of her people almost wiped out by the Empire if they don't comply. Um, Omega makes a, a friend here, Batcher, one of the lucre hounds that's kind of like a runt. He comes back into play later. The rest of this episode is just really us seeing what they're up to. Kind of getting more of the glimpses into that almost confirmation into what we already expected. That the Emperor is performing top secret research to try to become immortal. To have another vessel or body to transfer his consciousness into whenever he passes on which we see him do eventually um here's those clone commandos scorch dr hemlock nalase this is a vault that is guarded by these multiple barriers that actually turn on and off one at a time as you go down the hallway and in this vault is where the top secret research on force sensitive clones is actually located so this is where Hemlock keeps the most secretive stuff it comes back later in episode 3 now let's say Omega in the kennels with Batcher here and see they were actually going to put Batcher down because she got injured while defending the base and Omega was like why she, she can heal and the Empire just being all about efficiency and thinking that she's not worth the resources, wants to just get rid of her. Omega saves her by stopping the robot kennel guard from performing its duties and allowing Batcher to escape into the wild. Hemlock reprimands her, kind of really berates her in a way, saying that she's not intelligent because she doesn't realize that that animal will not survive outside of captivity by itself. Partially injured, being a runt in a hostile area. But we see o that Omega kind of represents that idealism, the optimism that tells you, well, you at least have to try. <laughs> so she wants to give the, the Lucre Hound a chance to live and a chance to thrive in the wild, regardless of it maybe not having a great chance. It ends with us kind of bleakly realizing Omega's still there, and that was just a glimpse into what's going on on Mount Tantus. Episode 2, as I was mentioning earlier, picks up with Hunter and Wrecker. It's pretty cool. They're visiting this crime syndicate in these... I don't know the species, but they remind me of... Um, See, look here. Actually, look just like Zivago from Rebels. So I think it's the same species. Similar how this one has the one horn chopped off. <laughs> Must have been a punishment for something. This is the ruler. And you see that she's pretty brutal when she executes, you know, someone she deems a traitor. This man right here, captain of her guard. Um, it's kind of just a setup to show us what's going on in this court before then we see Wrecker and Hunter bring in a rival syndicate member, a member of the Pike syndicate, the Spice Runners. Um, we see that this is someone she hired them to capture essentially, so they're acting as bounty hunters and they're not here for pay what they want because this crime syndicate has a lot of information is intel on where they can find Dr. Hemlock's lab and where they could possibly recover Omega because that's their main mission at this point. Um, they make the fair trade and get some intel. The intel leads them to a planet. And at first, I thought this might be Tantus, but then I also felt like they're probably going to go somewhere else first. And I don't really mind that. I feel like there's 
going to be plenty of episodes and that they're giving us quite a bit of details at a good pace this season so far, especially as this episode and next episode go on. Um, but they land on the planet and see it's another wooded but more jungle-like planet. Almost kind of reminds me of Jurassic Park, the first one with those big trees and the vines. But what's really cool is they run into... I can find them here. They run into some regs, some cadets, young regs that were just... I guess surviving in the forest here and they actually recognize them as 99s or defective clones <laughs> and Wrecker makes a funny joke says that he's defective and effective because that's why they are turned into clone force 99 because they have desirable malfunctions <laughs> um, they explain to them that they are not part of the empire they're not there to hurt them and that they're just looking for their friend, another clone, Omega. And ask about, you know, what they know about any Imperial labs there, about Dr. Hemlock. They do know who Dr. Hemlock is, and they do know of an Imperial lab they used to be located at. They go back to the cadet's base, where there's a third cadet, who... Uh, explains that basically this group ran away from the lab right before <laughs> Hemlock and the Imperials decided to take their research, go into orbit, and bombard the lab, effectively killing all test subjects and clones that were left. Um, pretty sad. So these are the only surviving clones from this entire research facility because they just happened to be off base whenever it got bombarded. And then... And then here we have them going back to the shuttle on the way to the lab because they want to boot up an old lab computer to try to get intel off of it. They realize that this lab is now not the right one. It's abandoned, but they might be able to get r intel on where they need to go next. So they go back to the ship, and they're going to retrieve a power source so that they can actually boot up the computer. So I like that little detail being thrown in there, since the computer would be dead for a while now. And this is a funny and practical use of Gonky. <laughs> being carried by Wrecker. So Gonky gets carried into the lab with the cadet and Hunter and Wrecker. The two other clone cadets that stay back consider just taking the ship and leaving <laughs> the other three there because they want to get off the planet and have been stranded there. And they realize that there is an Imperial research project gone wrong on this planet that is the reason that the planet was abandoned. Um, they call it Slithervine. It's a living plant that um, is con carnivorous. Eats plant. I mean, I don't know if it eats other plants, but it for sure eats living beings, flesh. So these cadets clones they know <laughs> to avoid this thing and it, that it will eat them so they know the base is just covered in this and they end up going I don't want to go there that's why those two stay back the one brave one decides to take Hunter and Wrecker there um, they go they end up booting up the computer having to hold off some hostile vines Hostile Slithervine while they're in there. The other two cadets actually do almost go try to steal the ship. But instead, luckily they hear on the comms that the others are struggling against this creature. This <laughs> the Slithervines. So here's a piece of one. 
and a piece of wine and just blast them out. And let's see, here we go. The solar vines actually reaching up, trying to grab the ship. The two clone cadets fly the ship over and drop some cables down so that the Bad Batch members and the other clone cadet can climb up the cables. And they end up dropping grenades, um, thermal detonators, into this mouth. Ooh, there it is. This ugly mouth of this slither vine. To me, though, this thing, this might be a deep cut or it might just be a similar type of creature. This thing reminds me of the Dringir from the High Republic that's actually been going on. Um, they were a large part of Phase 1 of the High Republic. And they were also a sentient plant species that eats flesh and is very... Um, I guess uh, almost like a virus just infests areas and just takes them over. So the Dren gear, very similar and a big threat to the galaxy back during the time of the High Republic. So this might be something similar to that or a later version of that that the Empire has been tampering with. But ultimately the clones make it out of there. They have their intel on where to go next. They um, actually make a call back to an episode that I know a lot of people disliked from season two. And it's that episode where they went to an island. They ended up finding kind of a safe haven to hide away from the Empire where a lot of, you know, exiles and just people that have been made refugees made refugees actually stay and the island is where I think they're going to drop these three cadets off so it's a nice call back to that and that island might actually come back as a home for some of the I mean some or whoever survives out of the bad batch if anyone does so see, there's those three clone cadets. Their voices were actually very similar to Tamura and Daniel Logan. So they were pretty spot on with the accent. I don't know who voiced them. I kind of want to find out if that was Daniel Logan again. Be really a cool, cool callback to the Clone Wars, especially since this is essentially the spiritual successor to the Clone Wars. This is that next story, the continuation of what happens to our clones. Daniel Logan came back and played Mox. It looks like Deke and Stack were played by Julian Dennison. So at least he reprised one of the clone cadets. So let's move on to episode three. Episode 3, as I was saying, goes back to Omega and Crosshair. You learn a little more about that plot that the Empire is trying to essentially clone Force-sensitive beings. This time, though, we see that Nalase gets interrupted and is not able to destroy Omega's blood sample, which means Dr. Hemlock is about to find out he has a viable genetic template on hand which at this point he does not know um, so Nala Se actually tells her you've got to go now you need to go steal my data pad you need to make your escape now because uh, Dr. Carr is going to run this test instead of me since I'm being pulled aside because we have a special visitor um, and that visitor just so happens to be the Emperor coming to check on the progress of his Force-sensitive clones. And him and Dr. Hemlock and Nala Se, you'll see that they all go and visit that super special vault. That vault that has uh, 
all the clone research in it. And Hemlock opens up a container that must house like a force sensitive being, maybe something similar to maybe something like Snoke, something along those lines or part way to Snoke and just not perfect yet, not high enough M count yet. Because I don't think that they are going to get Omega and get a complete template. And that's why Snoke is malformed and not, you know, not a perfect replica. Not a perfect um, template. But we see that Omega grabs Crosshair and they escape through the Lucrahound kennels where she had let Batcher out. The Emperor says, good job. Keep up the uh, good work. You'll have whatever resources you need to accomplish this because this is the ultimate end game for my empire to continue. So drawing more importance to this and um, how it plays out in the sequel trilogy and how the emperor is still around, how he has essentially always wanted to find a way to be immortal and to live forever. Um, let's see. As soon as the Emperor leaves, it's kind of funny. Hemlock gets the message that his clones have escaped. And he is kind of fed up with Crosshair and Omega at this point. They've tried to escape before. He just sends out the Lucre Hounds after him and says, I don't care if they get killed. At this point, he also does not know that Omega's blood is a perfect match for what he needs. So the test is actually going on while they're on the run. So I'm trying to draw some suspense and the test goes off and tells Dr. Carr, hey, this is you know the sample we've been looking for. That all goes down while Crosshair and Omega are trying to escape. They plan to basically steal a shuttle from one of the pursuing squads. They steal the shuttle. They end up getting into orbit. They're about to be shot down. And the only reason they really get away, it seems, is that the V-wings are called off because Dr. Carr gets to the control room and briefs um, Dr. Hemlock that they need Omega alive, that she is extremely valuable to their research and that she is what they have been looking for. So at this point, Dr. Hemlock makes a tough call of letting them go and ultimately just planning to use this, you know, full resources of the empire <laughs> that he has at his disposal. The emperor just told him that this episode. So kind of sets up the rest of the season to where I think hopefully we're going to see the Bad Batch reunited here soon, see Omega, Crosshair, meet up with Hunter, Wrecker. They, uh, in episode two, also mentioned that Echo and Rex, probably Gregor, and uh, maybe Wolf too, because we know he's going to be in this season that they are all off on a separate mission and that they will meet up with them in two rotations. So we know they will be showing up. So I'm hoping we get all those clones together, you know, pretty soon this season. And then the rest of the season, we can have this, this standoff, this battle to protect Omega and to get away from the Empire to find safety. Um... And this might also be the setup that I know my buddy Strike and a lot of others are wanting of the Delta Squad going after the Bad Batch. So that could happen. I know that Scorch is there whenever Hemlock is basically saying, you know, I'm going to go after him now again. <laughs> but I'm excited to see how this all plays out especially now that the stakes seem to have been raised even higher. Hemlock knows he needs Omega for more than just leverage over Nala Se. At this point, he needs her because she is the key to his research. And Nala Se knew this and was trying to hide it from him. So that's where we're at. 
I'm pretty excited after these first three episodes. I hope that you guys are too. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments. I'm excited to see where this goes. Excited to see uh, Wolf show back up. Hopefully Commander Cody. And I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for checking out the video.